welcome Peter to um, the live Q&A session. And thank you very much for your presentation today. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joining us for this session and encourage everyone to please feel free to submit questions uh, through the online portal, as well as you have the opportunity to vote question, vote for questions if there's ones that you would particularly like to see asked during this session. So um, I'm going to kick off with the first question for you, Peter. Um, so it's, it's, it starts with a technical question. Um, and I guess it's about the approach you use. So rather than micro dissection of tissue sections, what do you think the kind of opportunities are to use single cell DNA sequencing to identify these clonal mutations? And I guess what are the current limitations in terms of the sensitivity and specificity and do you think these can be overcome in the future? Thank you, Matthew. I mean, that's a really interesting question. I mean, of course, when one's sequencing a polyclonal tissue, if one could sequence single cells, then that would be the, the, ideal, um, the ideal experiment because then, you know, the, the single cells, would, we wouldn't need the, the cell to have expanded in any way uh, to find the mutations. The, in our hands, the current state of single cell genome sequencing is um, that one does get uh, one does get DNA back from the single cell. Obviously, and one can amplify that and and um, and sequence it. We find that there's quite a lot of LL dropout, so many of the regions of the genome just don't amplify. I mean, not surprising. There's only one copy of, of any given parental uh, haplotype um, for uh, or loci for a locus, uh, and sometimes that just won't amplify during the whole genome amplification. So it can be um, it can be difficult to get full whole genome coverage uh, from single cell sequencing. The other problem that we have had is that that you know you, you are essentially amplifying a single molecule of DNA and. The way that most of these amplification methods work is through um, is through exponential amplification. So um, so one copy becomes two, the two two copies becomes four, four becomes eight, and so on. And what happens is that any error made in the very first or second copy then gets propagated through all subsequent molecules during the amplification. And there's absolutely zero way to distinguish a um, such an artifact from um, from from a real true variant, uh, unfortunately, um, and we know that unfortunately, when we consider human cells, the the kind of rate of these artifacts during that first round of amplification is at least as high as the as the uh, rate of um, the rate of somatic mutations in the, in the original cell. So, so one winds up with a lot of uh, variants that are likely to be artifacts. Having said that, there are increasing, increasingly sophisticated and clever approaches for doing single cell amplification that one, don't use, um, uh, that, that use more linear um, amplification rather than exponential amplification, and two, use unique molecular um, identifiers so that you can uh, you know whether a given molecule is a is a new original is a different original copy essentially than than other molecules and these methods i think um hopefully in the future will um will come to um will come to to be very useful um the other approach for getting true single cell genomes that we have used quite a lot is uh to use if you like, in vivo amplification rather than in vitro amplification. So what we have done um, quite successfully across a range of tissues where this is um, applicable is to use uh, cell culture methods to, to, uh, to expand single cells. So we'll isolate single cells, for example, um, hematopoietic stem cells, we've also done it with bronchial cells um, and with organoid technologies. And we take those single cells and we expand them in, in culture um, into clusters or colonies or organoids and then sequence those organoids and because all of the cells in that organoid derive from that original single cell they carry that single cell genome and we know that the uh, that the, the the kind of replication error rate of a native cell is much better than the the replication error rate of whole genome amplification so we get much more high fidelity genomes and much better kind of genome-wide coverage much more even coverage and so um, that 
is a way to get single cell, uh, the equivalent of single cell genomes, but very easy to work with genomes um, from tissues where, where these single cell culture methods work well. Great, thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. So another question is uh, if you can use other uh, types of somatic alterations to track lineage, uh, such as structural alterations or epigenetic modifications of DNA to track the somatic evolution? Yes, so that's a really interesting question. So um, what we, so, um, so essentially, as you can see from the talk that we that I gave, you know, we've tended to focus on genome-wide base substitutions. Um, and the reason we do that is, uh, is several fold. The first is that they're reasonably frequent. They're by far the most frequent type of um, mutation that we see in the genome. Um, and so uh, they, you know, we get lots of them when we, when we sequence, when we do whole genome sequencing. Um, and secondly, you know, the genome's a big space, so, so when a mutation occurs, um, uh, it tends, it tends to, to only occur, you know, we, we know the probability which it occurs, and, and therefore it's un, we can know how likely it is that the same mutation has occurred multiple times independently, or whether a mutation is going to be, um, uh, so what we call identical by descent. In other words, it's one mutation that's inherited by, by the, all the daughter cells. And so, and, and, and base substitutions work very well for that because the, the rate is, there's the, the rate of, of individual base substitutions occurring is very low. People, uh, other groups have explored other types of mutation for tracking lineages. Um, there's a there's quite a lot of interest in using microsatellite instability, so uh, or or kind of slippages at microsatellites. So microsatellites are highly error prone uh, when they when when replicates when they're replicated, and so the length of those um, of those microsatellites can drift over time, um, and and because that mutation rate is is much higher uh, than ordinary base substitutions, what that means is that one can, um, one can kind of uh, focus on, on, on you know, a set of microsatellites that are particularly unstable um, and do kind of for the same amount of money, many more cells or um, 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 you know, a sort of a cheaper, cheaper kind of version than having to sequence the whole genome. That, um, that works well if you can call the microsatellite slippages. Um, it, it does sometimes run into the problem that um, that the microsatellites can you can get multiple independent instances of the slippage, and so so one has to kind of work out you know what the base rate of, of change at that microsatellite is within the population of cells that you're looking. So you can know whether a, a variant is when it's shared by two cells whether that's likely because those two cells share a common ancestor, or because uh, ancestors, two independent ancestors of the cells, both got the same change by chance. Um, but nonetheless, that is an approach. It, it also has the disadvantage that, um, that of course, one doesn't find functional changes, so driver mutations and so on um, tend not to be in these microsatellite regions, um, and so one misses out on that that piece of information. Um, other people have looked at mitochondrial mutations as a um, as a way of tracing lineage, and that's really interesting because um, mitochondrial the mitochondrial genome mutates at I don't know maybe about a hundredfold, thousandfold greater than the nuclear genome, um, and so you know many cells in our bodies will have you know depending on what age you are you know two or three somatic mutations in their mitochondrial genome, and you know there are enough that there are enough mitochondria in any, any given cell that you'll be able to potentially use that to do lineage tracing. It's not, it won't give you the kind of high resolution trees that, that, we, that we see when we do whole genome sequencing because you know, one or two mutations per cell just doesn't give you a very rich phylogenetic tree. Where I think this is particularly exciting and it's something that we've kind of talked about without ever having really um, properly um, stuck out, uh, uh, bitten into it as if you like, is to use a combination of 
um, genome sequencing on a relatively small kind of pool of cells, like the sort of studies that, that I talked about today, where we'll you know do a few two or three hundred genomes, reconstruct a kind of a, a kind of high resolution tree from those cells. And then what we've talked about doing, but not done yet, is to look at, is to think about whether you can use single cell transcriptomic data from that same person's organ system, where you will get lots of transcriptional um, information about the mitochondrial genome um, and call mitochondrial genomes, uh, mitochondrial mutations from the trans single cell transcriptome data, and then layer that mitochondrial mutation information back onto the high resolution phylogenetic tree that you've built so that you can kind of place those single cells or back onto a lineage tree that you've built from the genomes. The, the great advantage of that is that in theory that you also then have the transcriptome of those single cells. So if you want to study patterns of differentiation, lineage commitment, um, pluripotency and so on, this gives you, that would in theory give you a very high resolution way of doing so. Um, the kind of, as I say, it's a thought experiment at the moment, but I think it's, a, it's potentially a direction that would be really interesting to explore um, as these single cell technologies get more accessible and, and our kind of whole genome sequencing approaches get more accessible. Thank you very much. Peter, we've got a question from a viewer who enjoyed your lecture and is asking about TP53 which is commonly mutated in cancers, but also involved in DNA repair, maintaining stem cells. So is TP53 at the root of your phylogenetic trees is the question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So it, it turns out, and you know, perhaps not surprisingly, the, the uh, answer to this is, is relatively um, nuanced. So we've now sequenced a range of different um, normal tissues as I, as I kind of uh, hi highlighted in my talk and we see we see p53 mutations occurring in normal tissues um, across a range of those um, tissues but at quite variable frequencies so we see p53 mutations at quite high rates in uh, in squamous tissues in particular so skin esophagus uh, um, bronchial epithelium um, and there it's, you know, up to depending on what age you are and whether you've, um, whether you've smoked and engaged in other um, unhelpful lifestyles. Um, what you'll find is that, that, you know, anything up to 5-10% of cells will have a P53 mutation. The other place where we've seen P53 mutations is in, um, is in normal blood particularly in the normal blood of people who have been exposed to chemotherapy previously. And what we think is happening there is that it's not that the chemotherapy is causing the uh, P53 mutations to occur, but when the chemotherapy is given, the, um, that promotes the expansion of any hematopoietic stem cells that have a P53 mutation, um, and then they get a kind of boost that the normal cells don't. The normal cells suffer from the chemotherapy, but P53 mutations are relatively resistant to the chemotherapy, and so they have a selective advantage and expand. So I think there's quite a lot to be, um, there's quite a lot to be uh, delved into um, in, in terms of the role of p53 mutations in, in normal tissues um, for sure they're there um, in some tissues for sure they're being selected for um, it's quite likely that the local microenvironment um, that person's lifestyle you know medications that they're on all of that kind of uh, that kind of person level um, information seems to kind of shape the way that these normal tissues um, uh, evolve um, and, and kind of, you know, presumably shape the balance of P53 versus other um, drive mutations. And, and that's quite a, an intriguing area, I think, that, that we will be exploring over the next uh, five, 10 years. Brilliant, thank you. Great. So Peter, I've got another question that's come in here regarding your prostate work. Um, and the question is, is the spike in pubescent mutations completely explained by what is expected from the increased cell division at this stage? Mm. Or is it higher or lower perhaps to other things like changes in gene expression due to hormonal changes? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. To be clear, we, it's not 
our data does not suggest that we're seeing and necessarily an increase in mutation rate, but rather an increase in um, branching branching in the phylogenetic tree. So, so you know, when we talk about somatic cells, a branch a branch point in a phylogenetic tree um, is is um, represents an ancient stem cell division or a cell division rather than necessarily a stem cell division. Um, and, and that cell division, you know, leads to two daughter cells and essentially the branching, the branch point that we see is the kind of creation of two independent lineages that we are now sampling decades later. So what we see in the prostate data is, um, is that, that we see an increased density of these branch points or these kind of archaeological records, if you like, of, of, of ancient cell divisions. We see an increase in the density of those during the time of pubescence. And we're timing that to pubescence from the kind of molecular clock that the mutations give us. We see those, those um, branch points lined up at a particular kind of stage of molecular time. Now, it's a really interesting question. Do, um, does the does cell division itself increase the mutation rate, and therefore, do we would we expect to see an increase in mutation rate over um, over um, uh, you know over pubescence, pubescence or puberty when these um, when these kind of increased rates of cell divisions are occurring? And I think probably um, we don't formally know this but it does seem where we've looked at situations where there is an increase in mutation in sorry in cell division rate um, and typical times of increased cell division rate are obviously very early in embryogenesis um, so when when you're going from a single cell up to a little human um, that obviously involves a huge amount of cell division and over quite short periods of time it does seem that the mutation rate is a little bit higher at those early stages of um, uh, embryo uh, embryonic development also when we begin to when we compare um, cancers to uh, normal tissues in the same individual um, often we find that the mutation rate is higher in the cancer but the same mutational processes are active in the cancer as in the as in the normal um, tissue and so it would seem like just the increased cell division is associated with with a slightly increased um, mutation rate Having said that, when we look at, um, it, it is definitely more complicated than just, you know, increasing cell division leads to increasing mutation rates. Because when we look across the range of normal tissues that we've studied, um, we find quite a huge variation in mutation burden. So if I take a 60, 60 year old person, um, you know, th their average blood cell will have about a thousand mutations, their average liver cell will have 1500 mutations, their average colon cell will have about 3000 mutations. Um, and what is reasonably clear is that, you know, those tissues, you know, colon and blood are very mitotically active. Um, and yet col an average colon cell will have 3000 mutations, but an average blood cell will only have 1000 mutations. Liver um, is not particularly, at least in normal liver, is not particularly mitotically active, and yet it will have more mutations than, than a hematopoietic stem cell. So it's not, it's, there's not a, it's not an absolutely straightforward relationship that the more times a cell divides, the more mutations it has. But there does seem, I would think, to be some sort of relationship, if I had to, if I had to predict. Yeah, so following in that question, there is uh, here a question that says if, uh, do we underestimate somatic mutations as we can only measure those which are tolerated or beneficial? If so, how much higher would you expect the actual rate to be? Um, so this is a really interesting question and, um, and one that I think we we have kind of partial information on and it's something we're sort of looking to, to work on a, a bit more intensively over the next year or two essentially the way that we can measure you know, essentially that the, the 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 person is asking about negative selection are there mutations which kill the cell and we just will never see because the cell is dead and, and lost to the world um and the way that we can get at that is um and we've done this in cancer um and we've 
done some preliminary work in normal tissues, but it, it kind of it's still we're still fleshing it out. Is to look at the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations because you know, for a mutation to kill a cell, it has to do something, and you know, the vast majority of synonymous mutations are just that. They're synonymous. They don't change the protein that, that's encoded by the gene. And so it would be, you know, for most synonymous mutations, it would be pretty hard to construct an argument that says this mutation is going to kill the cell. Um, so we can kind of use the, the, the kind of synonymous mutation rate as a, as a, as a background to, um, to, uh, to kind of work out what the expected rate of mutations is. And then we can look at non-synonymous mutations because if there were any cells that were going to, any mutations that were going to kill the cell, they'd be non-synonymous mutations, either nonsense mutations or, or missense mutations, splice site mutations. And we can look at the ratio of non-synonymous mutations to synonymous mutations. And when we correct this for all sorts of things like, you know, the, the, um, the sequence context and, and everything else, then we can kind of estimate, are we seeing more or fewer uh, non-synonymous mutations than we would expect for the number of synonymous mutations. When we do this in cancer, we find actually that for the vast majority of genes, there seems to be very little evidence that, um, that there's a depletion of non-synonymous mutations in cancer. So it seems like the vast majority of mutations that are occurring in the genome do not meaningfully impact the fitness of that cell and there's not being uh, things selected for. Now that's in cancer where obviously there are also a bunch of, of mutations that are strong positive drivers and it may be just that the positive drivers completely swamp the, the, the minor negative effects of, of, of passenger mutations. Um, when, so when we look in normal tissues and as I say we're still kind of working on this um, but I would say it doesn't look like there's a whole bunch of non-synonymous mutations being depleted from um, from these cells. So, so I don't think that there's a lot of evidence of negative selection. I think in some senses that's really quite interesting um, because it tells you probably, it tells you a bunch of things. It tells you something about what the immune system is doing because the immune system will only notice non-synonymous mutations. The immune system will be blind to what happens if it's synonymous mutation. So it suggests that actually the immune system is largely kind of ignoring this sea of, of, of non-synonymous uh, mutation that these cells are getting. Um, and it tells you that actually much of the genome is largely dispensable for somatic cell function, which is potentially quite interesting. That's point mutations. I think it's quite likely that there is negative selection for um, larger scale genomic abnormalities. So things like massive genomic rearrangements, big deletions, chromosome gains and losses. We do see these in normal cells from time to time, you know, maybe about 1% of liver cells, particularly when someone has liver active liver disease, about 1% of liver cells will have quite nasty looking um, genomic rearrangements. We see them occasionally in other cells, um, uh, and, uh, um, but, but nowhere near the rates that we see in cancer. And I suspect that the vast majority of, kind of structural abnormalities actually are uh, negatively selected um, um, and deleterious to the cell. Um, so, so, so my guess is that if, if there is negative selection acting on somatic cells, it's, it's going to be much more pronounced at the level of structural variation and, and chromosomal abnormalities than, than at point mutation levels. Thank you. Peter, we've had a couple of questions about the protected regenerative cell populations in the lung or the mm. liver and how do they actually escape mutation after exposure to carcinogens and then is that regenerated tissue still at higher risk of cancer or, or further damage or has that damage been reversed? Yeah that's fascinating and we'd love to know the answers to these questions. I, I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sort of leap into some speculation here. In, in the lung, what we see is that, um, is that if you take smokers, uh, current smokers, and you sequence um, their bronchial epithelial cells, virtually all of the cells, you know, maybe minus one or 2%, have got you know, 
card carrying damage from tobacco exposure. They've got mutations that have a signature that we know is, is, is driven by carcinogens in cigarette smoke. And so the vast majority of cells have, these, have this damage. When we take ex-smokers, so these are people who've smoked sometimes for you know, decades and heavy smokers for decades, but have given up um, and they've given up for a few years and we, and we look at the, the cells, the, the, their lung cells, we see this kind of two sets of cells. We, cells. we see plenty of cells with lots of damage from the cigarette smoking, but we see this much larger population of cells that are seemingly would look exactly like a, a cell in a non-smoker. Now, it is not the case, I don't think, that, that those cells with a normal mutation burden and no signatures of tobacco smoke, it's not that they've reversed that damage. They haven't suddenly sort of magically gone around and repaired the genome wherever they had a mutation previously. These, I think, must be cells that somehow managed to hide from the tobacco um, uh, mutagenesis for the time that the person was smoking. And then the fact that this population of cells is so much larger in ex-smokers tells you that when that person stopped smoking, suddenly those cells were kind of able to expand up and repopulate the, the, the bronchial epithelium. So where have those cells been hiding? And what triggers them to expand? We don't know, and we'd love to know. It's interesting because the mouse models of bronchial epithelium suggest that there's a population of cells that sits beneath the um, beneath the in the submucosal gland. So, so, so a bronchus will have um, submucosal glands that secrete the the mucus that that makes sputum, um, et cetera, et cetera. And and if you take a mouse. Um, and, you, and you expose it to an agent that completely denudes the, the bronchial epithelium, uh, and you have kind of various lineage tracing um, uh, genes switched on, what you'll see is that, that, that there's a population of cells that grows out from the ducts of the submucosal gland to repair that denuded epithelium. And it's never been known whether that population of cells exists in, in humans, but it certainly would be um, it would be a kind of interesting concept that there might be this protected niche in, in humans that just kind of expands up to, um, to, to repair the bronchial epithelium. Coming back to the second question there, which is, what is the relevance of this population for cancer? Well, if we sequence tumours that do arise in ex-smokers, they all have the signature, or virtually all have the signature of mutation damage from cigarette smoke. So of those two populations of cells, the lung cancers that emerge in, a non, in an ex-smoker come from that damaged population, not from this population with very low mutation burden. So one imagines, therefore, that this population of cells that's expanding up is, um, is cancer protective, is much lower risk of cancer um, trans transformation than, than the cells that have received all that damage over the years. And in fact, that fits quite nicely with the epidemiology because the epidemiology of what happens to your lung cancer risk when you stop smoking is really quite remarkable. Basically, you know, you begin to get, you begin to, it, it, if, if you have two, let's say you have two um, siblings that have smoked the exact same number of cigarettes for, for the exact same number of years, and then one of them has this sort of epiphany and decides to give up smoking and the other one carries on smoking, what will happen is that um, over time, almost from the moment that the one stop, decides to stop smoking, his or her rate will diverge from, from the sibling that continues to smoke. Um, and it, there's no kind of latency in that. It, the, 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 the benefits start straight away when you stop smoking. And it's sort of tempting to, to speculate that at least part of the reason for that um, almost instantaneous benefit of stopping smoking is that suddenly these cells can begin to expand and, and um, repopulate the bronchial epithelium, although there are many other um, causes likely as well. Great. Peter, thank you so much. I mean, a uh, fascinating final discussion point there. Um, unfortunately, the time is up. It goes very fast. Um, but, but we would certainly like to very much thank you for, for you know, spending the time to record your seminar and, and to answer the questions today, as well as the audience who also joined us. Um, this is also just a reminder that um, there's a new seminar every month uh, and we have a, a full schedule already, all 
all, way, all the way to the end of the year already, so please have a look. Um, next month's speaker will be Dr. Emma Davenport, who is a faculty member in the Human Genetics Program, and she'll be talking about stratifying uh, sepsis patients through transcriptomic profiling. So thank you once again, Peter, for joining us, and thank you everyone in the audience, and we'll see you next month.